Good day, Dick. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Hey, I'm really glad to be here. And John, Guy, you're just great to do this sort of thing. I learn from you all the time. So I'm happy to have the opportunity to chat with you about this. Well, stuff. well, you know that I'm only channeling all my many mentors. Uh, and yeah, that's what we all say, but it's not true, actually. <laughs> Well, recently you shared with me some uh, research that you were very, very excited about, and that's what we agreed to do this video on. And uh, before we jump into the details, can you give us a little background about this research and who's done it? And it, is it accessible to our audience or is it, you know, what can you share with us before, before well, we- Well, you know, er everybody has their weird traits. And one of my weird traits is I really like to read new research. So I scan maybe- 20, 25 different articles that had just been published during the week. Um, and I read some in depth, obviously, if they look interesting. My university lets me, lets me have access to all of the research journals internationally. And I think the public can't do that. I mean, it would cost a fortune. So I have that access. I do read the stuff. And I feel like one of my roles, like you, actually, is to try to pull it together and make it available to people out there who share our interest and our action, our, our activities in, in learning and development. So here's what I can do. I'll talk a little bit about there's some universities that are doing interesting work lately. Let me just mention that, for example, uh, Georgia State is uh, really doing some interesting work in something called attention control, which is a brand new idea. And it's pretty extraordinary, I think. Um, Carnegie Mellon. People at Carnegie Mellon University are working in a new approach to how fast people learn, what the differences are in learning between people. And they've come up with what I think is a pretty brand new idea. Um, my own university, University of Southern California, has been working in cognitive task analysis, which is one thing I want to talk about today. Uh, so those are some of the universities working here. I'll tell you what, when we finish today, I'll send you one or two articles in each one of these three or four areas that we're going to chat about. Uh, so you can post it online for people to take a look at. I'll, I'll do my best to get off some stuff that's actually readable. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Terrific. Well, let's dive in. Okay. Well, the first thing is something that's near and dear to our hearts, I think, and that's training design. Um, now, new ideas come along all the time in that area. Some of them are new. Some of them are not. One of the things that's discouraging here is that we tend to use the same terms to describe things that are actually quite different than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago, even though that term has been used for a long time. Um, one of the things that's becoming clear there, and the thing I want to mention, is that we've got to stop lecturing in training. And the reason for that, our usual strategy for training is to find an expert, let that expert sort of describe what they do and teach trainees how to do it by describing it. But what's happening is those experts are describing what to do and why, but they're not effectively teaching people how to do it. How to do it requires something that a lot of people have been calling for years, deliberate practice, or there's a new term, fully guided learning. Um, and what it means is not only describing what to do and why, but how to do it step by step. In other words, demonstrating how to do it. And then in addition, and very importantly, giving each person who's trained the opportunity to practice individually, plus it's a team activity, and then they obviously have to practice together, and to get corrective feedback if they make mistakes and get an opportunity to correct that. When you do that, learning increases an average of 40 to 60% in about 30% less time. Trainees like it better. And apparently because it reduces something that psychologists call cognitive load. That is the number of things you have to keep in your mind as you're learning something new. And it, it, it brings it to a more tolerable level. So people don't get frustrated or more importantly, angry. And when people get angry in training, they, they opt out. And that's one of your failure rates, I think. Um, and it can be offered online without a live instructor in, in many instances, which is, I think, less expensive, although you've got the initial expense of generating the online presentation to begin with. So deliberate practice, fully guided learning, but what it means basically is practice with feedback 
as well as what and when and why to do it. So when you first shared this with me, I thought, well, this doesn't seem to be new because I think that wherever I learned this in the past informed my practice. And I, you know, one of my uh, lesson mapping techniques is to backward chain and describe what's the application exercise what's the practice with feedback okay do i need to give a demonstration okay to so that it all makes sense what information do i have to provide and try to keep that as tight as short as possible to get people into the demonstration and then into the practice with feedback so what's new about the research on this is it just confirming what has been known for a while or I'm not sure. You know, I wish what you were describing was common because I do think there are people that are have gone on to this for a very long time. I, and I particularly think if what you do is being assessed in some way by a corporate sponsor or by a client, you better be clear that you taught people how to do something effectively. But where it's not being used is much more common than where it is. For example, uh, online colleges, and there's a lot of them now, or small two-year institutions, where their job is to teach people to do things. They're getting degrees in areas where they're going to go out and get jobs and presumably know how to do something. And that, it's not happening there. What's happening there are the kinds of experts give lectures, they give tests about your knowledge of what to do, and then they assume that people will go out and discover, they'll translate the what to do into how. And guess what? They don't. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the evidence is, by the way, that in those instances, only about 34% of the trainees succeed, and they it takes them about an hour to figure out how to do something. Uh, whereas with these fully guided instruction or this uh, fully, this, uh, whatever it's called, the one that includes practice and feedback, you can 64% succeed, and they do it in about 30% less time. So there's the benefit is a huge more, many more people succeed in much less time, but that's not going on most places. I, think. Mm -hmm. I always think of this as uh, we put people into formal learning and then expect them in an informal learning manner to figure out how to apply what they've learned. And they often leave the learning experience without that. And then they go back to the job or continue with education. And they, they really not internalize that well enough because they've done nothing with it other than perhaps yeah. pass a knowledge test of some sort. Yeah. Or, and they've got to discover how to do it on the job. And that's not a good place to discover something. Yeah, that leads to trial and error or social learning where you're asking your neighbor and because of the non-conscious nature of knowledge that that neighbor may not be able to give you exactly what you need. So that goes back to trial and error learning. And that's... You know, I, I've said that, you know, that while that may eventually be effective, it's certainly not efficient. And uh, thank you for sharing the, the data with us about this. So hopefully it encourages people to make sure that they include deliberate practice of the fully guided learning. I, I like that, that phrase. There, there is one more thing I think that needs to be said for the rest of us and that, that, that are really been focused on this for a long time, which is that over time, what it means to practice and give corrective feedback actually has changed somewhat. And I think it's a good idea every now and every few years to check and see, is there an update about how, what the best way is to do this? What's the most effective way to do it? Because generally there is. Fair enough? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, so um, uh, what's the, the, the next area of research that you wish to cover? Well, I want to talk a little bit about cognitive task analysis, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. But the interesting thing is that many more people are becoming interested in it. Um, the evidence for it seems to be overwhelming. And here's basically why I think it's important. It's about the content of training. It's about what we're training people to do and how we capture that. Now, cognitive task analysis obviously involves a strategy for interviewing experts and getting them to tell us how they're doing something step by step. And the, interest, the, the, the reason for doing that is that experts are only about 30% aware of the decisions they make when they work. They, they, they're they deeply aware of their actions. For example, I've worked with surgeons with this, and surgeons can remember everything they can see themselves doing. So they don't make any mistakes when they talk to surgical residents or trainees about what to do with their hands or the equipment that they have. 
where they make mistakes is when they forget to tell trainees about decisions that they have to make that might take them off on a different path with certain clients. And it turns out that experts can remember only, uh, consciously remember, only about 30% of the decisions they have to make. I mean, three out of 10. So the other seven, they actually make those decisions, but they don't, they can't remember them. Now, there's some good reasons for that, but the bottom line is that just asking an expert how they do something is not going to get you what you need for training. Cognitive task analysis takes that 70% to about 90, or that 30% to about 90%. And the and way you do it is by interviewing three to six or seven experts before you actually decide what the content of that training is going to be. You overlay all of them. And when you see a new decision, you go back to the others and say, do you have to make this decision? And they go, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, of course we do. So you get validation by, by checking with them as you go through. And it makes a huge difference in the result of training, I think. Yeah, I've heard you say before that uh, to give the novice what they need, you really need to cover all their, their thinking tasks, the cognitive tasks that uh, the experts have automated. But, but when I've talked with other people about this and shared this online, I've had people come back to me and say, well, you know, I ask people to think out loud. And, and to get at the tacit knowledge versus the explicit knowledge. But, but what you're talking about, the cognitive tasks here, they're not accessible. So you can't ask me to think out loud and I'll come up with that because I won't. Now, if somebody else mentions it, I may recognize that, yeah, that's, that's something I do. That's a decision I make. But, but so can you quickly or briefly cover the differences between explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge and these cognitive tasks, this automated knowledge? Well, people use different words to describe the same thing. Um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about this unconscious or tacit or, you know, it's called a, a automated knowledge. They're more or less the same. Um, apparently, in evolution, we all, evolution made it difficult for us to learn things that we uh, permanent, that, that are permanent with us, that, that stay with us. But the risk is to learn wrong things and then to learn them and express them and make mistakes and not know it. So what happened is that we evolved to have very sh small short-term memories that are conscious. And as we do things and they become successful, our minds automatically make them unconscious so that they don't take up space in our conscious mind. That automation is almost always most important with decisions, uh, not with actions, but with decisions. Actions, we have motor memory, you know, our, our muscles rem our automate things also, as a matter of fact. So why can't we remember them consciously? Well, again, because it would have to be into our conscious, it'd have to become from our memory into our conscious mind. And that is only a very small space. We used to think we could think of at any one time seven plus or minus two things. So somewhere between five and eight, nine. Recently, that got changed to three plus or minus one. So we can remember somewhere between two and four things at once as we're working. That's, that's nothing really. And yet our, what would you say, our, our deep memory, our unconscious memory is unlimited, at least theoretically unlimited. Certainly we've not found the maximum yet of it. So this is why it's a problem. Uh, how do we manage uh, this automated knowledge? It turns out, by the way, that we can learn wrong things. I mean, <laughs> we've got a whole world <laughs> evidence for that. And the difficulty with learning wrong things is that once we automate them, once they're unconscious, they're extremely difficult to change. We got funding at USC to have an international conference of all the experts in the world that study this automated knowledge. They came from all over. It was a really an exciting conference. And the topic was, how do we modify unconscious knowledge? And it was a head scratch 
for a few days by some very bright people because there's not a lot of evidence about how to do this. We can talk about that as a separate issue sometime. Mm -hmm. But now there's a lot of research underway that ex asks exactly the question that you did. How do we modify things that have been learned that are wrong? And how do we get better access to the 70% of unconscious knowledge that people who are expert at something can't remember to tell us about when they're trying to help us with our design of our training? Um, one thing, just one other thing as, as about this automated knowledge, that when you actually discover it and put it into training, it makes a huge difference. Um, a few years ago, we were working with an online university and they wanted to study this. Did it matter to do this cognitive task analysis? Because it's a bit expensive. You have to interview three, five, six experts and so on um, and get them to interact with each other about the results of what they've said. So what we did is took a, a, a very large course that they had in um, spreadsheet development, people learning to use spreadsheets. And there were the students in it were randomly assigned to three different conditions. One was lecture about how, about what and why, and then discovery learning. The second was this guided demonstration, fully guided demonstration and practice that we're talking about. And the third was the same kind of instruction, but with cognitive task analysis content, rather than what we got by asking the expert just to tell us how they did it. The discovery learning, what we call discovery learning, uh, only had about a 34% success rate in the first hour of training. The guided demonstration based on expert, but not with cognitive task analysis, doubled that, six, almost 64% we got in 49 minutes. So twice the learning in about 30% less time, which is great. That's a benefit. But the CTA-based training got us 89% success in 29 minutes. So 40% more and 50% less time yet at the end. Now, I think you have to, I mean, it's a cost benefit analysis to yeah. decide which is most important. Uh, just one other thing before we close this off for right now. Um, we've been given a grant to create an artificial intelligent version of cognitive task analysis. This would interview experts and produce at the end of those interviews a scenario that would be able to be pulled into training about exactly how you do this, actions and decisions step by step. Very exciting. When will when is that projected to be available? Well, we're about a third into it. We've run out of our in our, our initial investment and we're out there looking for money to continue. I do actually have a, a conversation scheduled in, in a few days with potential funders that are, I think, really interested in it. So we're, we're, it's going to be another year to a year and a half before we're finished. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is not quick. And by the way, hiring people to do it is almost impossible because everybody's working on AI projects now. Yeah, yeah. We keep, and we keep programmers for an average of about a week and a half. <laughs> and we get a turnover. Yeah. Imagine. The lack of well, and universi universities don't pay huge salaries, so... Yeah, you're competing with the big companies that are interested in this. Well, thank you for that. And I'm real excited to, to learn more about uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, applied to cognitive task analysis. I think that'll be a huge boon for making the instructional content uh, more complete, um, which is you know going to be helpful for speeding people and learning and all that. So what's your third area of research here that you'd like to talk about? Well, actually, I think this is quite new, but it's 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 new to psychologists anyway, because I think in the past, we've always thought that the learning differences between people and training were due to intelligence we, and motivation, too. But if you hold motivation constant, everybody, let's say it's not going to happen, but let's assume everybody's equally motivated. We assume that when some people learn more or faster than others, it's always because they are smarter. And that that's a genetically determined thing. It's not necessarily something we do. The evidence now from work that's gone on at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, a guy named Ken Kodinger heads a research project there that's doing really exciting things. And they've been working on this for about 10 to 12 years. And their, their evidence now, and it's got everybody excited, is that if deliberate practice is in 
progress. That's if you have these fully guided instruction. And if motivation is constant for people, that everybody learns at exactly the same rate. The difference between people is not their intelligence, but what they know when they start training. In other words, it's prior knowledge that determines the learning differences between people. And that actually is, is a pretty new idea. Um, certainly, it's got a lot of people in psychology with their heads spinning. They, they actually sent out all of their evidence from this, this thing that they just published to the, the international community to comment on it before they did the final version. So they gave everybody a chance to take pot shots at them, and the idea survived. So trainees, apparently, that are doing poorly, if they're motivated, they just need prior, they needed more prior knowledge to benefit from the training that they have received. And this is so exciting, this data. The Army actually has completely revised the way they do training. They're very focused now on prior knowledge. And they have developed a test for prior knowledge that determines who can take training. And if you can't take the training, then they have, if they still want people to be able to perform, then they begin to now know they've got to shift you into a previous training course that gives you the prior knowledge so you can benefit to what you need to do now. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, um, that makes great sense. I'm, I'm surprised that this is, I can understand that everybody thought that intelligence was the huge lever, but but prior knowledge, that don't, that just makes sense. It just seems to be common sense to me. Yeah, but have you have you ever heard anybody claim that anybody can learn to do anything? For example, get a PhD in math, the sciences, physics, get pick up an MD degree if you're interested. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah, really, you're right. Huh? You're right. And because and, the assumption was always that there's certain people who possess the ability to do these things. There are math gurus or tech gurus or whatever it is. Not true. They're just people who have spent more time with the prior knowledge needed to do that. And if they decide to learn and they're committed and they're focused, they can do it. It just takes more time for some people, given what they know going in. So what are the implications to instructional design, learning experience designers? Uh, you know, how do they address this, this need to establish what are the prior knowledge prerequisites before somebody takes something so that they can ensure people get it or, or do pre-testing to make sure that people have the fundamentals or basics or whatever those prior knowledge elements are? Well, there are some tests out there that are beginning to be developed. As I said, the military has one. And uh, there are a couple of others. Now, nobody's really satisfied with the tests yet. And to me, if people in L&D got involved in this, because I agree with you, we've been concerned about prior knowledge forever. Every, I mean, it's, a, it's one of those does that yeah. some people just simply don't know enough to succeed at what you're asking them to learn. For example, if you're teaching somebody advanced math that doesn't have the basic math for it, that's, that's a no-brainer. But I don't think people realize it's the same thing everywhere. So the bottom line is, I wish some of us would think more carefully about how to measure prior knowledge and commoditize that, because that's a commoditizable test or approach, I think, mm -hmm. and maybe sell that as a product. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that... Uh... Uh, if you hold the motivation constant and it, the differentiator is prior knowledge of people and their their ability to be successful. And if I can imagine if you don't have that prior knowledge and you're in a learning experience and you struggle, that's going to affect your motivation. So that's like the double whammy. Absolutely. That, that's an important thing to say is that here's where motivation and learning kind of connect. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not doing well and you've been expected to do well and think you're being expected and you realize you don't know what you need to know to benefit from what's going on, that's a real problem. Yeah. And it upsets people, it makes them angry, it makes them depressed, it makes them withdraw from what they're doing. So I think we'd, we'd, have a, we'd make a huge contribution here if we did more work in the measurement of prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you. So where's this uh, fourth area of research that you want to talk about? This is the one that excites me the most, actually. And I think it's the newest. Um, uh, it's in motivation. Or at least that's where it's been placed. And it's recent evidence that the ability to control our attention 
During a time we're learning, in other words, not to become distracted is the missing element in motivation, learning, and in creative problem solving even. Um, attention, uh, uh, by the way, this, this work um, is, the, uh, is what's going on at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon right now and Georgia, and Georgia State. Um, Georgia State's doing the best work here. Some very senior people have been working on this now for a number of years and have just started to publish their results. Apparently, what they found is that attention apparently is the, is, creates a pathway, a conduit between what's happening around you and your brain. And without it, your brain just can't process anything different than what it already knows. It can operate on what's out there, whether it's training or problem solving or whatever it is, without your attention letting it in. I mean, I'm sorry to be so basic about it, but it turns out that this is huge. Um, if we get distracted, we cut off our contact with, with whatever it is we're trying to do. And by the way, that's what happens when we try to multitask. Multitasking is a total myth. It not only doesn't work, it makes things worse. And I have a sense that the people that argue for it might be attention deficit. I mean, we have this thing called attention deficit, and it, it affects about 5% of the population, about 1 in 20, more men than women for some reason. And I, I think that it gets turned into a strength. or they, uh, I think people that have attention deficit are trying to turn it into a strength, and it shouldn't be. It's just a little bit more challenging for some of us to focus our attention and control it than it is for others. Um, Attention control accounts for 70% of intelligence, 70%. In other words, when you take the ability to control attention and correlate it with IQ scores, the overlap is 70%. So people that get better IQ scores are generally people that have learned to control their attention better. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the evidence. Um, it's also the bridge between motivation and learning. It supports both persisting at a task, which is a huge part of the motivation element, mm -hmm. and it obviously supports learning. We can't learn without being paying attention to whatever it is that we're trying to do. Um, general intelligence relies heavily on the ability to regulate your mental activity, that activity that's needed to achieve goals and intentions. And so that, again, is another reason why this attention control is important. Um, depression, impulsiveness, uh, negative emotions, and anxiety make it difficult to control attention. So it's also important that we learn how to control our emotions. Uh, you know, when you get upset uh, about something, the best evidence is that you should quit and go exercise for 10 minutes. You know, it actually works. If you get really upset, uh, uh, 10 minutes of hard exercise actually will pretty much calm you down and focus you again. Uh, so there's a number of other strategies that work there that we could talk about if you like, but I'm so impressed with the fact that we can learn to control our attention. We can get better at it. There's a lot of current research on how to train people to become better at attention control. And once having done that, what we can achieve has got to increase exponentially, I think. It almost seems to me that not only do we need to help people learn how to learn, we, part of that is learn how to control your attention, to deliberately remove the distractions, the music in the background and uh, other conversations happening in the room or whatever might be a cause for a distraction. But, but what are some of those strategies that I, that I can use besides the, the maybe obvious ones? Most of them involve talking to yourself and, um, making a record, a formal written record of your experience when you are in training or attempting to solve problems. So if you keep a record of when you got distracted in the middle of something, what caused it, and the strategies that help you overcome it, uh, that actually makes a difference. Ask yourself what might work next time you encounter this. Make a note of it. And then when you go back to that situation or something similar to it, read your notes. Go back and check to see what, what hurt and what helped. Um, second thing, if you get anxious, angry, depressed during training, 
as I said, that strong exercise thing really works. Dance, run, walk, do yoga, tai chi, whatever it is, and then go back. And if you can't do strong exercise, there's some evidence that something called mindfulness meditation has a real positive impact. Uh, you can That's something you can Google, mindfulness meditation. And by the way, the simplest way to do this is something called the four by four by four. It's a breathing exercise. Uh, you inhale and count to four seconds, and then you hold it for four. You exhale and count to four, 1,000, 2,000, and so on. And then you, you, you hold your breath for four seconds, and then you start it over again. If you do that for a few minutes, it generally resets your clock. It reduces the negative emotion you're feeling, makes you more predisposed to do whatever it was before. And that's, I think, a fairly important suggestion. There's a third one. And this is like the first one in a sense. It asks you to make a record of, of what, of, of this task that you were doing where you had to quit because you got distracted. Um, it, like, it's the pros and cons of not allowing that to happen, reminding yourself consciously. And by the way, a lot of the research suggests that reminding yourself means that you not only should think it, you should say it. What are the pros of, of the, the values that I had for this task? And what are the cons? What negative things am I avoiding by continuing to pay attention and not allowing myself to get distracted? Mm -hmm. Basically, those three things. Excellent. That's it's fascinating. I guess you really have to know yourself and understand what distracts you so you can uh, uh, consciously avoid that. And if it happens to you, talk yourself back into being consciously attentive. I, yeah, we're all different. I mean, people have different things that upset them, different things that attract them. And so you have to actually just honor your own individuality and make a note of what works and doesn't work for you. Yes. Well, Dick, thank you so much for sharing this with us. So, what, so can you give us a general sense of what you're up to besides reading these 20 to 25 papers every week? And uh, <laughs> so uh, what are you doing in your life right now? And what are, what are you, are you focused on anything in particular? Well, the biggest project for me now, and for some time along with, and I want to mention Ken Yates at the University of Southern California, uh, uh, who's managing day to day, this artificial intelligence project. We really, really want to be able to develop a high, an effective version so that the AI will not operate on the internet. It will operate on what expert tell it, experts tell us. It'll interview experts, mm -hmm. interact with them, create a scenario based on what they tell us about how to do things, capture the decisions that they have, that some of them, actually, you know, one of the interesting things we've learned is that different experts automate different decisions. And that's it, it's the, the the correspondence between experts is only about twenty percent, or sometimes thirty. So only about a third of the decisions are common between them, and others I have conscious memory of others. So it will it will interview many different experts until it has as close to a hundred percent of the decisions that they can. And I'm excited about that. I think automating it is going to make it more available for everybody. Uh, eliminate these hundred different versions of cognitive task analysis, 95 of which apparently there's no evidence about whether they work or not. And I think it's going to make it easier for all of us in L and D. Well, again, thank you so much for sharing uh, the, these areas of research and giving us an update about uh, what's going on with cognitive task analysis and uh, artificial intelligence. I think that's very, very exciting and hopefully it'll, it'll help. Uh, people embrace doing this to make their instructional content more complete, which is all to the good for the people who are trying to learn and master uh, the knowledge and the skills and their performance. And thank you, Guy, for making this possible. I really think this is a great service that you do for all of us. You're most welcome. Uh, just just trying to pay it forward, <laughs> as we Me all too. should. Yeah. Thanks again, Dick, and uh, right, you have a great right. day. All right, take care. All right, bye-bye.